Okay, so, so the the uh, for, format for the panel is first of all, e each of the panel members uh, will will make some uh, opening remarks for about eight eight minutes each, uh, and then we will move straight to the floor discussion. I mean, uh, this should be a very uh, interactive session. That there's many uh, senior policymakers in the audience, uh, so whether adding perspectives from your own uh, uh, country or or asking. Uh, Questions of the panel. Uh, I did just make, invite you to be be ready to actively contribute uh, after the, the, the opening uh, re remarks from the panel members. So, so with that, uh, let's jump right in. And the the first panel member to speak will be Alfred Kammer from the IMF. So, uh, good morning to uh, everybody. Uh, thanks, uh, Philip, for the uh, invitation, and I'm happy to be able to join you all here uh, uh, today. Uh, let me uh, start where the SESI region is uh, headed. Uh, activity in the SESI region is slowing down. Uh, labor markets remain strong. Now, our expectation, as you can see in the chart, is uh, that for the region, we will have a soft landing, followed by a mild recovery in uh, 2024. Those are the projection parts on the right side. Uh, domestic demand and inflation are slowing. That's what we are seeing. This reflects less fiscal support than last year and the impact of uh, central bank financial tightening. The recovery will be driven by improving real wages as nominal wages catch up, catch up while inflation is continued to decline. But in our view, we are in a precarious uh, situation. A return to the economic conversion, which Valdis has mentioned, is at risk from the possibility of persistent inflation and what it can mean for competitiveness and the costs imposed by geoeconomic uh, fragmentation. Inflation, as you can see here, has been pushed to worrying levels. Uh, headline CPA last year was above 10% in most SESI countries. While we expect inflation to come down rapidly in 2023, as you know, commodity prices are declining and that is showing up in headline inflation, this inflation will proceed more slowly next year. A concern in our baseline forecast is that we expect inflation to stay above central bank targets until 2025, and that is a very long time uh, being away from uh, uh, central bank targets over the last few years. So why did inflation stay so high until now, and why does this matter? We see two forces pulling in the same direction. One, the global factors. They played a part, high import prices and pass-throughs of costs to consumers, partly accounting for the high profits you see in the charts, were one force. But the other uh, driver was domestic factors. Domestic demand last year was well above what is consistent with inflation targets. This was driven by public support and ample household savings uh, still left from the pandemic. High inflation matters as it leads to strong wage growth. And you can see that in the dark wedge in the chart on the very right side, which in turn is becoming an increasingly important driver of inflation itself. This year, average weight growth across SESI countries is set to exceed 10%. And an extended period of high wage growth could lead to more sustained inflation than what we have in our baseline forecast. Unit labor costs could start exceeding productivity growth and competitiveness. And now to the other part of uh, the issue, and that is uh, global fragmentation affecting the region and it's going to be a disruptive force. While food and energy prices are receding, many countries are turning to inward-looking policies and they raise production costs and potentially prices and dampen long-term productivity growth. Uh, for example, onshoring, reshoring and other FDI-related activities are hotly debated in the private sector and you see a, a chart here uh, documenting this. Now, it's true as President Lagarde pointed out, that uh, the global reorientation of trade and of supply chains 
offers growth opportunities uh, for the region, uh, given its uh, proximity uh, uh, to uh, uh, the, 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 the euro area countries. But these uh, opportunities will only be available when wage costs evolve in line with productivity and competitiveness is not being lost. And I will come back to these opportunities from fragmentation, but uh, let me elaborate on the risks first. There is a risk that fragmentation of global value change and trade could add to the inflation problem and lower growth. Looking just at restrictions in commodity trade, the economic cost from segmentation in access to these critical inputs could be 2% globally and the estimated 3.5% in emerging Europe alone. This impact could be inflationary by raising production costs while also dampening long-term productivity increases. It is important that SESI countries prepare for the downsides of fragmentation. Here, retaining cost competitiveness will be one of the critical elements. Now, our number one concern remains containing uh, inflation. And for us, this is the number one issue uh, SESI countries need to tackle. Uh, as you can see here in the chart, co-inflation in SESI countries remains well above euro area rates, and that creates possible price, wage, and competitiveness gaps. Our policy advice is for those countries uh, which have monetary policy levers to maintain a tight monetary policy stance until inflation pressures clearly and sustainably ease. And in particular, that means that discussions on easing monetary policy right now are premature as long as inflation, uh, as long as core inflation is still above target and far above target. And rather, and that is important, central banks should communicate clearly uh, that if they expect that uh, this inflation is not to materialize, that further tightening actually will be required. For several SESI countries, monetary policy uh, is constrained, and there are other policy levers which can be used. And that brings me to fiscal policy. Uh, fiscal policy needs to help fight inflation and preserve buffers, given the shock-prone world we are uh, entering. But when you're looking at 2023, ambitions look rather modest in light of the very strong labor markets and robust domestic demand. We should note that even in small open economies, fiscal policy can help with this inflation. And we did a study of the Baltic countries. Uh, if you're using fiscal uh, deficits by one percentage points of GDP there, the impact on inflation is half a percent. And that will matter if we are closing in on the inflation target where every little help uh, is going to make a difference. But this is also important because uh, fiscal policy helps anchoring expectations and it has a signaling effect, which uh, uh, to some extent is reflected in responsible wage setting behavior. So fiscal policy matters not only because of the demand impact, but also because of uh, setting expectations. And uh, we have discussed these uh, options uh, in terms of uh, uh, fiscal consolidation in SESI countries. Uh, one of them is going away from broad-based energy support, cost of living packages, and make them more targeted or eliminate them altogether as the energy crisis is receding. And the second one is uh, to capture uh, and maintain and save windfall tax revenue, which has materialized over the last uh, year. So those are easy, uh, relatively easy things to do. In, in terms of helping on the fiscal consolidation side. And I also want to mention that uh, fiscal adjustment matters because uh, if we are concerned about financial stability risks, uh, that means we want to be careful uh, on overburdening monetary policy and having to take care of everything with uh, policy rate increases. Now, uh, coming to the fragmentation part, uh, here it's uh, uh, important that uh, SESI countries uh, position themselves in order to mitigate the effects and also to take care of uh, uh, the opportunities being 
offered. And what you can see here is that CESI countries are extremely well integrated in global value chains and providing a huge value added uh, in that uh, 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 domestic value added to goods they are exporting. So well placed to benefit uh, from uh, 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 opportunities. But that points back uh, again to get, getting macro policies right to, to take advantages of, uh, of this opportunity. And that uh, leads me to my uh, conclusion. Uh, one concern we have is that sustained high inflation reinforced by fragmentation can erode productivity and competitiveness. Uh, what it means for uh, policies, uh, we need the right policy mix. That means uh, do not ease monetary policy too early and fiscal policy should help with this inflation. And uh, as mentioned by uh, Valdis, that puts us uh, then to the other part, which is important, and that is to move on structural reforms, which matter for pro productivity and long-term growth. That means to get the investment climate right uh, by improving uh, uh, governments and the corruption frameworks to durably attract uh, investment, including foreign direct investment. It means to retain a intact financial sector while the banking systems look generally sound and strong, there are credit and interest rate risks uh, that are high and supervisors need to be uh, vigilant. And finally, uh, we need to tackle labor market transitions. They come because of changing consumer demand, switching from goods to services, but also through reshoring policies. And uh, what that means is uh, enhanced employment programs, to rematch and uh, uh, skills, and also in the longer term to uh, think about training and reskilling in an ever evolving demand on skilled labor. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Alfred, for a very comprehensive uh, tour of the major policy issues. Uh, and the next speaker on the on the panel is Deborah Revtelas from the European Investment Bank. So over to you, Deborah. Thank, thank you very much, and uh, uh, it's uh, really a pleasure uh, to to have an opportunity to address uh, this audience uh, and uh, talk about the macroeconomic policy challenge for uh, for uh, the region. I was thinking at uh, the angle in which I could uh, best contribute in the panel, and I saw that. Uh, um, one of the elements that is quite, quite important to understand is in this moment is how the uh, monetary policy tightening uh, is uh, reflecting in financing condition. So the transmission challenge, uh, channel uh, to financing condition uh, in the region, uh, because of the specificity of the transition channel uh, for the region is uh, as well, uh, very important in the moment in which uh, we discuss about uh, the needs of investment uh, for the digital and green transition. And uh, that's, uh, that's uh, what uh, I will uh, actually uh, try to detail uh, a little bit more. And uh, I will leverage on two things. Uh, one is uh, a survey, a bank lending survey for the um, Central Europe and Southeastern Europe region uh, that we run as part of the Vienna Initiative every six months. Uh, we just published uh, the, the new release uh, of the survey looking at uh, uh, bank lending uh, condition uh, in the region and also uh, our survey of uh, um, firms, uh, um, this one uh, focusing uh, mostly on the EU side, uh, so on the, on the uh, EU member states uh, uh, part of the region uh, only. So where do we start? Uh, the main message is uh, structurally we know uh, that the region is more affected by, um, by uh, credit, uh, credit conditions. Um, the, the percentage of firms that are credit constrained tends to be higher than the rest of Europe and the percentage of firms that have enough uh, financing, uh, internal finance uh, to finance uh, the, their investment is lower. So structurally, we always see the region as uh, uh, more finance uh, constrained. And what I find interesting is also the discrepancy between finance constraint between a large, medium, a small and micro firms. What uh, um, we, we know is not uh, a novelty that uh, would be everywhere, uh, that uh, micro and small firms are particularly affected. What I found interesting is uh, 
to look at uh, how the tightening financing condition uh, uh, during uh, the, uh, the pandemic period and the subsequent shock affected the different firms. What you see is that at the moment of tightening, everybody was uh, very strongly affected. In the moment of a relaxation in 2021, after the huge uh, policy stimulus, Actually, large and medium companies, they declined very fast, the uh, finance constraint, but that was much less for micro and small. And then uh, the, the, the reopening of uh, fin uh, finance and tightening is, uh, is coming back and affecting all. But what you see is that the shock affects differently firms. And even in the relaxation phase, uh, micro and small uh, remained uh, much more uh, uh, constrained. So the policy support was not really helping uh, this uh, group of firms. But at the end, uh, what we see and uh, know that uh, structuring, uh, structurally, credit constraints uh, are uh, stronger in the region and particularly stronger for uh, micro and small uh, firms. Then uh, what is happening uh, with uh, the monetary policy tightening? Uh, we see that uh, the region has uh, started uh, the monetary policy tightening um, earlier than uh, the euro areas in, more, in most of, uh, uh, of uh, the countries. On the right side, I'm starting to depict what we see from the bank lending survey. And here the data are presented in net percentage of firms. So what you see is uh, that actually we are uh, clearly in a phase of uh, tightening a uh, supply condition uh, while uh, we are in a phase of uh, softening a uh, demand condition uh, but uh, still with uh, uh, moderate uh, uh, very very low net positive on the demand side so we see more uh, more uh, uh, the uh, effect on the tightening of uh, supply condition and that's uh, the picture that we see over time for uh, all uh, the region if uh, we look at uh, the component of uh, the effect of uh, supply condition uh, tightening, uh, you see that actually is coming uh, all over. Uh, all over the component are affected on the supply side. On the demand side, uh, we see some, uh, you can call it a worsening of a demand condition. Uh, you see housing, other consumer very much uh, on the uh, negative side. Uh, you see some demand remaining uh, on the positive side on working capital uh, and uh, on the debt restructuring, but clearly also on fixed investment uh, turning uh, to the negative. So the switch uh, is uh, uh, towards worsening of the demand condition. We were trying uh, benefiting from the fact that the survey started uh, um, the, the, the survey of uh, the Vienna Initiative started in uh, 2013. We tried to do some uh, simple econometric to, to, to see the uh, impulse response to policy shock, both on the supply and demand. And uh, what we see is uh, that the impact uh, tend to be stronger of a policy shock, tend, tend to be stronger and faster on the supply condition and also more persistent on supply condition. I found that this interesting because it's something that anecdotically we hear a lot for the bank in the region that actually when policy, when tightening of supply condition is passed through from the parent company to the subsidiaries is actually quite strongly passed through across the board. So actually the tightening comes across the board in, in, in the region. So um, when we look at uh, the, what is happening uh, to lending grow, actually we start uh, seeing a contraction in terms of lending grow in the region uh, as well, but uh, still with a, a positive number in terms of lending grow on aggregate. We were uh, at, as well uh, trying to look at uh, the policy, uh, at uh, the impulse response of uh, policy shock on lending grow. And uh, we see that uh, the stronger impact uh, actually uh, comes uh, after three years, uh, but actually the shock uh, starts to be, to be quite uh, felt after three quarters. So we start having already the pass-through from uh, the policy impulse, uh, having in, in mind uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, the uh, policy tightening uh, already was anticipated in most of uh, the countries uh, of uh, the region. But uh, the full pass-through tend to take uh, longer uh, and uh, go uh, toward uh, uh, three years. 
Um, this is a co very complex graph, so I would need a lot of time to explain it, but I wanted to pass the message that is uh, that in the region there is a lot of talking uh, of uh, uh, the, uh, the, the challenge for a small open economy. And in fact, uh, what you see is uh, that when the uh, interest rate differential opens uh, compared to the Eurozone rates, what you have is a shift uh, on a foreign currency lending. And actually, the foreign currency lending is then financed uh, through cross-border uh, um, bank net lending. So the tightening uh, of monetary condition may have a pervasive effect if uh, this, uh, this, uh, um, this uh, cycle that takes uh, uh, place. And actually, we have uh, some evidence in the region uh, that uh, that may be starting uh, to, uh, to take place in some of, uh, uh, of the countries. Um, on the funding side of banks, we don't see major pressure coming in in terms of uh, total uh, funding and access to funding. Actually, the banks in the region, in the Bank Lending Survey report uh, that they see positive development on the funding side, with uh, the uh, clear exception of the concern related to the MRL that actually there is a market of MRL in the region and a lot of questions coming in on the stability of the market and the cost of funding related to the MRL. So that's uh, one part uh, which is uh, creating uh, some concern uh, for, uh, for uh, uh, banks uh, uh, in the region. Um, but overall, uh, what does it mean uh, for investment? And I think uh, uh, in all of these, uh, we have to come back to what Alfred was also mentioning. Uh, uh, having investment uh, taking place in the region is a combination of uh, different uh, aspects. On the one side, uh, there is uh, a lot on uh, business environment. And the year we show just uh, what the firms uh, tell us in terms of uh, the main constraint for investment activities, there is a lot related to uncertainties, business condition, even the availability of skills. So the, the concern for the region are very much still also structural. So we have the financing issue taking place. You see that availability of finance is more relevant than for Europe overall, but still there are a lot of other factors that affect investment. And if we go back also to the discussion that we had on public financing, I don't put here uh, on uh, projects uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, public financing, I think uh, the complexity of uh, having the skill for delivering uh, on the large public investment projects uh, that are on the plate uh, is, uh, is important. I would like uh, to conclude uh, with a very quick uh, um, analysis uh, that uh, we have been doing and that's uh, related uh, to uh, what the EAB is doing. Uh, the EAB is in fact uh, financing uh, banks uh, for banks uh, to lend uh, to SME on investment project and uh, most time on uh, investment project uh, that have a purpose either on the climate side or in the innovation side. We were trying to look at uh, the impact of this uh, on lending to banks, and uh, we have the advantage that we ask banks uh, to report back the name of the firms uh, that received our financing. What we see is uh, that after three years, so if uh, we monitor the firms uh, that received uh, the EAB supported the lending, and we monitor how these uh, firms grow in the next uh, three years compared to identical firms uh, that uh, didn't receive this policy support, we see that actually overall in Europe, uh, they are much more likely to have uh, invested, to be growing, to have uh, more employment, also to be slightly more uh, investing in intangible, more productive. So we see a grow effect of this access to finance, which is uh, quite important because it reflects uh, what I was saying at the very beginning, uh, the structural element of underdevelopment of market and more credit constraint in the market. I was uh, repeating uh, the same analysis uh, on uh, Central Eastern Europe only and comparing the result versus the overall results for the EU. And what you see is again an additional positive effect in terms of this on lending versus the rest of the EU in terms of additional growth effect for the firms 
employment effect, also investment, and very strong on intangibles uh, as well. Basically, what we see is uh, that uh, really uh, targeted uh, support uh, for uh, companies uh, focusing on investment needs uh, can have a very strong, uh, um, a strong effect uh, on the firms uh, per se. And I think uh, that says uh, something in terms of uh, the policy support that should be implemented, maybe more targeted, that can have a more important effect. And with that, I close. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Deborah. And the, there's really quite a lot of striking evidence about transmission through the banking system in, in the survey you showed. Um, maybe I'll ask you just to pass the clicker uh, along to, to Boston at the end. Uh, and the, the next... Uh, uh, speaker is Boston Vasley uh, uh, from the uh, uh, Central Bank of Slovenia. So over to you. Uh, so good morning to, to everybody and uh, Philip, thank you for invitation. I will also talk about the current challenges uh, we are all facing in our economies and especially the, uh, on the response of uh, policies which have already been uh, implemented and uh, also the, the the future one so past uh, past three years were marked by uh, by, by two uh, extraordinary uh, shocks which uh, completely changed uh, our uh, macroeconomic uh, landscape and also how the policies are are, are operating and uh, the main focus uh, became uh, inflation again so uh, after the outbreak of COVID, the first uh, the first uh, influence of the pandemic was uh, deflationary. We uh, we witnessed a shutdown or closure of a significant part of our economies. We were also staying at home, working from from home. So the demand uh, fell sharply, and also the prices of uh, energy, other commodities went down. So initial phase was deflationary, but uh, that was the only the only phase with with uh, such uh, such pressures on price dynamics. Uh, later, when uh, the pandemic uh, started to recede a bit. Uh, uh, when uh, re uh, economies uh, reopened, uh, the prices of energy reversed and started to contribute to uh, inflation dynamics. The same was true for services. Uh, additional demand, new demand, pent-up demand uh, pushed uh, service prices up. And also supply chain disruptions uh, influenced uh, other groups of, of, of prices and uh, inflation started to, to increase. After uh, after uh, the the second shock, the Russia aggression on Ukraine, this was only emphasized. Uh, inflation accelerated further. It also broadened and uh, peaked uh, at the end of uh, around the end of last year. Now at the moment we are in the next phase of inflation when we can see. Uh, headline inflation going down, but mainly due to lower uh, energy prices. You can see at the end uh, already a negative contribution of energy prices towards overall inflation. But on the other uh, hand, core inflation remain high, remain re resilient, and uh, our main forecast is that it will stay at, at this uh, relatively high level uh, in the next months uh, as well. Uh, also, growth was uh, very much uh, affected by by both uh, shocks, although it turned out to be more resilient uh, uh, as uh, compared to what we thought at the outbreak of the first shock and also at the second shock. So, what we what we uh, saw was uh, relatively relatively high growth in uh, 2021, also in 2022, and for this year we are expecting a moderation of growth, uh, quite significant slowdown of growth, but still uh, on uh, overall it will be a positive growth momentum for, for our economies, uh, economies uh, in this year as well. As for the uh, CZ economies, both trends were more pronounced. Discrepancies of growth, which uh, outperformed uh, euro area growth and EU growth uh, uh, as well, was uh, due uh, to several uh, several uh, factors. Uh, most fundamentally, due to uh, still ongoing convergence process, but also to strong uh, policy support, including labour market measures. So the growth was. Uh, 
in general uh, much higher as compared in these countries in this region as compared to euro area but this is also true for inflation it was uh, higher uh, primarily due to higher uh, dependence uh, on on energy but also uh, also due to uh, developments in the labor market, strong labor markets, strong wage growth, again, stronger wage growth as compared to EU, EU average, and this uh, all contributed to, to significantly higher uh, inflation in this region. So we, we uh, entered uh, this year, 2023, with a positive growth momentum, although slowing down, but also high inflation. And there are some uh, global trends uh, which will affect uh, our economies, all of them, but uh, they might have a stronger impact on uh, CZ economies due to the geopolitical uh, situation and uh, also, also the location. And uh, what uh, Alfred uh, already mentioned is that uh, we are very much uh, dependent on global uh, value chains the value chain participation rate is significantly higher in, in the region as compared to the EU average. And of course, this is an important uh, headwind for, 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 for our growth. So what is, uh, what is a possible scenario is that uh, the growth momentum will slow down, the inflation will remain higher. So in a way, we'll be, we'll be facing uh, the, the stag stagflation uh, environment, uh, or at least this is a significant risk for, for, for this part of, of the economy. So as for the, the economic policy response, of course, uh, the, the primary role is on, on monetary policy. And in past year, we did uh, quite a lot. The uh, interest rate increase campaign was uh, actually the, the strongest one since the establishment of the ECB. Altogether, we increased uh, our main rates uh, uh, for, for 400 basis points. But compared to the, to the high inflation, also the, the highest increase in inflation in past, uh, past years, uh, relative uh, comparison is slightly different. And that's uh, why we'll probably have to, to, to go further in order to also to see the reversal of core inflation and not only, and not only uh, headline inflation. But uh, having in mind uh, the level of inflation and also how broad-based it is, it's obvious that uh, uh, only uh, the monetary policy response will, will not be uh, enough. Uh, other policies, uh, fiscal policy, wage policy, and also other structural pol policies will have to, to act uh, in complementary way to, to, to lower inflation. And this is uh, especially, uh, especially important in the region since uh, the compensation, if you're looking at the uh, labor market and the wage developments, uh, it's, uh, it's obvious that uh, wage growth was significantly higher uh, in this region as compared to EU, EU average, thus uh, contributing significantly more to overall inflation. The same might be true for, uh, for, uh, for fiscal policy uh, as well. Uh, the fiscal uh, impulse is still strong. And we, we can talk about uh, three phases of uh, interaction between monetary policy and fiscal policy. For the first one, uh, at the outbreak of the COVID, it was necessary that both policies are aligned and they actually were aligned. So strong support from monetary policy and even stronger support from fiscal policy. Then in the second phase, uh, during the Russia aggression, uh, fiscal uh, support was still needed, but the general consensus was that uh, it must be more uh, targeted and more so more temporary. And uh, looking uh, looking backward, uh, this was uh, actually the case. But now, when, uh, when the inflation is becoming uh, very persistent, it's uh, staying uh, relatively high. Again, the alignment of uh, policy might be much better as it is uh, at the moment. So. In order to, to bring inflation down with the lowest possible cost, uh, fiscal policy will have to follow the lead of monetary policy and reverse uh, its, uh, its trend uh, uh, as well. So to conclude with, uh, compared with, uh, with past uh, three years with COVID and Russia aggression shock, uh, 2023 started on much better terms. But it's still challenging for, for policy makers since the growth is slowing down and inflation is uh, staying very persistent. Uh, 
So with monetary policy, we already did a lot. Uh, we are prepared to do more if needed, but uh, high and broad-based inflation calls from uh, other, other policies to, to react as well. I mentioned monetary policy, wage policy, but also structural policies, since they are uh, very much uh, important for, how, uh, for the overall business environment in which firms operate, in which firms set their prices, determine their, uh, their profit margins, which are uh, again, uh, again, uh, important uh, contributor to, to overall uh, inflation. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Boston. And now let me turn uh, to uh, Sergei Nikolaychuk from the National Bank of Ukraine. So over to you, Sergei. Thank you, and uh, <clears throat> good morning to everyone. And uh, first of all, thank you very much to the European Central Bank for inviting uh, our bank to be uh, the part of this conference. For us, it is very important to be the member of European family of the central banks, as uh, it highlights our Ukraine's uh, efforts uh, for the EU integration. I understand that my uh, intervention today will differ from uh, what my fellow panelists uh, spoke of. Other countries in the region uh, uh, discuss macroeconomic uh, uh, responses to the second round effects uh, from the Russian invasion of Ukraine and can afford uh, uh, to underline other often long-term uh, risks and challenges. In the meantime, we are in the epicenter of uh, this horrific reality, uh, terrific, uh, uh, terrible reality, while trying to navigate the economy and ensure macroeconomic and uh, financial stability. Uh, since uh, Russia's full-scale invasion last year, Ukraine has been facing enormous uh, challenges in conducting all elements of macroeconomic policy. Along with other state actors, the Central Bank of Ukraine has been forced to make decisions under constant shelling, risk of occupation, power blackouts, destruction of uh, whole cities and territories, and overall uh, exceptional uncertainty. Nevertheless, we have successfully maintained our focus on safeguarding uh, price and financial stability. At the initial state of the full-scale war, in order to prevent the panic and to preserve uninterrupted functioning of the banking system and payments, uh, we adopted a wide range of uh, classic anti-crisis measures, such as uh, fixing the exchange rate, uh, introducing tough capital controls, easing requirements for banks, and providing them with uh, vast uh, liquidity. Um, Moreover, to ensure uninterrupted funding of the critical expenditures of the government, the NBU started uh, supporting state budget via purchasing government uh, bonds. While these early measures uh, helped the banks, uh, businesses and households to quickly adapt to the new reality, this mix was not sustainable in the long run. That's why we uh, started to adjust our policies and ration our resources as the failed Russian blitzkrieg moved to a war of, of attrition. The need for such changes in policy was uh, clearly indicated by the fast depletion of the international reserves as uh, our FX sales were not covered by the official inflows. Thus, we had to repack exchange rate by uh, uh, 25% recalibrate capital controls and hike the key policy rate from 10 to 25 percent. Our life became, become, became easier as international aid uh, grew and the IMF approved new programs uh, for Ukraine, first program monitoring with board involvement at the end of the previous year, and then full-fledged program EFF in March uh, this year. This support allowed us to fully focus on ensuring macroeconomic stability. And uh, I will now walk you uh, through the outcomes we were able to achieve. In fact, today we are considering path to normalization of our policies, something difficult to imagine a year ago, ago in summer of uh, 2022. Let's start uh, with uh, a fixed market. As uh, since February 2022, exchange rate has been our main uh, nominal anchor. Meanwhile, in summer last year, we saw that this initial peg supported by tight FX restrictions diverted from the fundamentals. 
reserves approached the dangerous level, multi-currency practice was entrenched and led to additional demand via permitted channels. Thus, as I said, we repacked the exchange rate by 25%, while Thursa tightening the capital controls. This gave us space on the fixed market, but spread widened again after a while. As a fixed mismatch shrank, partly due to the grain deal, international support accelerated and the reserves position uh, improved, we refocused uh, the goals of our FX regulation towards minimizing the spread between the exchange rate on cash and interbank segments of a fixed market. That was an important lesson for us, still allowing a wide range of inter-border transactions. The restrictions leading to the multi-currency practice may become counterproductive at some moment. So we expanded the options for population to satisfy its demand for a fix, while in addition strengthened our financial monitoring and made additional efforts to improve attractiveness of assets in national currency. As a result, exchange rate expectations stabilized and the spread between exchange rates has almost disappeared. Uh, here, let me explain how we manage the attractiveness of assets in national currency in wartime. In our policy mix, the key policy rate becomes a secondary uh, supportive policy, policy tool. Uh, the hike from 10 to 25% in June a year ago was done primarily to stabilize the fixed market and ensure the attractiveness of assets in national currency. As in many other, uh, even advanced economies, we have faced weak transmission amid vast banking se sector liquidity. In our case, uh, the excessive banking reserves were the outcome of central bank purchases of bonds and the fix from the government. In order to strengthen that transmission, we employed both conventional and unorthodox tools. For example, reserve requirements were revived as monetary instrument. The ratios were increased uh, in several steps in overall by 10-20% percentage points, depending on currency and term, helping to freeze some uh, part of the liquidity on corresponding accounts at the central bank. Moreover, the allowance to fulfill some part of the required reserves up to 50% by eligible government bonds allowed to push the revival of domestic borrowings by the government and eliminate the monetary financing of the budget this year. In addition, the NBU introduced three months certificate of deposits uh, at preferential rate linked to the bank's uh, retail term uh, deposits stock in national currency. All that led to further increases of banks' deposit rates and uh, uh, increase in the share of term deposits in all deposits of the uh, households. In its turn, the growing attractiveness of assets in national currency and its stability in a fixed market allowed us to reverse the inflation trend and bring it down significantly to below 13% in June from the highs of almost 70, 27% at the end of uh, the last year. However, the inflation, especially the core component, is likely to show persistence moving forward, as in the region overall. Here, I would like to underline that uh, the headline inflation path was not out of line with the region's trends. That contrasts a lot with the monetary policy outcomes during the first wave of Russian invasion in 2014-15, uh, uh, as you may see from the uh, right plot. On, uh, the, we expect that in the next years, inflation will decelerate further thanks to the tight monetary policy, subsiding security risks, proper recovery of logistics and, har and larger harvests. But bringing inflation to the target also has a long way to go, which in our case uh, complicated by extreme level of uncertainty, as just recently was confirmed by uh, destruction of uh, Kakhovka uh, hydro power plant by Russia. Uh, anyway, presented success in stabilizing the fixed market and reducing inflationary pressures was in significant part determined by the fixed exchange rate regime supported by tight fixed restrictions. However, at other, other time, the cost of such framework could outweigh, outweigh the benefits. First, it leads to increase in market distortions, expansion of the shadow economy and the diversion of resources to unproductive uses. 
Second, it pushes both stakeholders and market participants to internalize expectations of a fixed exchange rate and stimulates the accumulation of a fixed risks. Finally, the economy is uh, deprived of the opportunity to adapt to the changes in external and internal conditions through the exchange rate flexibility. Thus, the NBU has been actively, uh, the NBU with the support of the IMF experts has been uh, actively working on creating proper conditions for gradual return to inflation targeting with load in exchange rate. This ambition has been recently reflected in the strategy for gradual normalization of monetary policy developed with uh, IMF experts as part of EFF conditionality. The strategy is primarily conditions driven and heavy on assessment of risks for the implementation of its steps. We are confident that uh, this cautious approach will bring us closer to our goals of long lasting macroeconomic stability and uh, sustainability of economic growth, even under conditions of uh, extreme uncertainty. In, in conclusion, I would like to underline the following. Despite all terrible consequences of war, our people have shown incredible resilience while the economy has successfully adapted to the new conditions. Preservation of the macroeconomic, monetary and financial stability facilitated heavily this adoption. The current macroeconomic situation is conducive to carefully embark on the path of monetary policy normalization. In fact, we have already implemented some measures of the fixed liberalization roadmap and are progressing on creating final preconditions for the return of uh, exchange rate flexibility. At the same time, the support of international partners, both financial and military, remains crucial for Ukraine's victory, macroeconomic stability and quick post-war recovery. That's also important for the macroeconomic performance for the whole CZ region and uh, the whole world. Again, thank you very much for your unwavering support.